So today you find yourself at Photography, Art, and the Politics of Landscape. My name is Laura Marjo. I am an assistant professor here in Community and Regional Planning, and I teach specifically in Indigenous Planning, Community Participatory Methods. Um, I'm from the Scogie Creek Nation, my tribal towns, my where my family is from before displacement are Tuskegee Tribal Town and Alabama Tribal Town. And since Virginia got to do a show and tell yesterday, I'm going to do a show and tell. So at the Art Museum, Will Wilson had critical indigenous photographic exchange. And what he did was he took on the idea of um, Edward Curtis and that type of or photography with the 18th or the 19th century wooden photography, wet plate photography. So this is an example of um, mine that I did. So what you do when you engage in this, you go through the entire process of the photographic process. And so you learn to appreciate that idea of where the stoic Indian sort of comes from. Like on this, I wasn't trying to be stoic. You actually have to hold your, you have to keep your eyes open for 15 seconds while the plate develops. So I had a different appreciation of that and I try not to do um, the same sort of pose. I tried to have it something more contemporary in the moment with my prayer fan, a Seminole jacket, my iPad that um, I think I go to sleep with that as my best friend, <laughs> and my um, let's go get jewelry. So I just wanted to show that to you guys to start off with because this session is really about the politics of photography and the political aspects of photography. So I will now introduce our wonderful speakers. Our first speaker is Raphael Berfo, a photographer, PhD in art history, an associate professor at Bordeaux Montagne University. Her PhD dissertation, 2005 to 2010, was entitled Landscapes on Request, Photographic Missions in France and Germany in the 1980s and 1990s. Her work focuses on the aesthetics and political stakes of artistic photographs, orders representing landscapes. In 2013, she published a book called La Mission Photographique de la Data à Laboratoire des Territoires Contemporains. Today, her research focuses on the institutional, artistic, and professional and vernacular uses of photography and visual representations of the territory since 1945. Next, and her talk is entitled, From the American Survey to the French Mission, What Photographic Landscape Policy? Next, we have Lucy Lepard, who is a writer, activist, and sometime curator. Since 1966, she has published 24 books on contemporary art, cultural studies, and place, including Mixed Blessings, New Art in a Multicultural America, 1990, Partial Recall, Photographs of Native North Americans, 1992. The Lure of the Local, Senses of Place in a Multi-Centered Society, 1997. Down Country, the Tano of Galisteo Basin, 12, 1250 to 1782, 2010. And Undermining, A Wild Ride Through Land Use, Politics, and Art in the Changing West, 2014. She has been co-founder of various artist groups, including the Art Workers Coalition, Ad Hoc Women Artists Committee, Printed Matter, the Heresies Collective, Political Art Documentation Distribution, Artists Call Against U.S. Intervention in South or Central America, the, Guer the Guerrilla Performance Groups, Outside Agitators, and Damage Control. She has curated some 50 shows, often in non-traditional venues, most recently Weather Report on Climate Change in 2007. For 19 years, she has edited, edited El Puente, the monthly community newsletter for Galisteo, New Mexico, where she has lived for 23 years and is active in community planning and other local issues. Her talk is entitled, Looking, Then Seeing, Critical Landscape Photography in the Changing West. And we'll have Raphael first. Let's give them a welcome. Thank you. Okay. 
and we can talk about it in the discussion. But I want to focus on the expression made by this prefix commission, which includes institutions, photographers, and landscape, to discern the divisions and conventions between survey and mission and the landscape policy at stake here. Even the distance, it seems that the two projects fits in a similar historical context in the United States and France. In North America and Europe, territories have known profound change since the Second World War. They have been deeply changed by the economic boom of the post-war, with the construction of large equipment and communication infrastructure, the development of cities and areas of suburban and commercial area, among other things. They became almost unrecognizable to their contemporaries, who see just one horrible country. In the US, as in Europe, the radical transformation required the implementation of new representation. This frustration works around these mutations of the territory will be organized, especially around the question of the landscape. Landscape becomes the focal point and the translation of all the problems linked to the territory. It makes visible, sensitive change and conversion in progress. And it is through this question of the landscape that institutions will attempt to catch the territories in the late 20th century. So it is here, rather, the implementation of landscape policy and the photographer has the responsibility to make visible the everyday or vernacular landscape. To reach this aim, they must emerge from an and I, sorry. To reach this aim, they must emerge from an idealized vision built by the persistence of representation from the 19th century, feeling a form of nostalgia. This drawn trend towards the past is initiated by a sudden change since the World War II on both continents, associated with the sense of social, political, economic crisis in the 1917s and 1980s, which leads to a form of refuge in an idealization of the recent past. The invention of this new landscape is partly assigned to photographers through the public commissions. Both Jackson and Auguste Lambert underline the need of this sort of projects and the role to give to images. It's interesting to notice that in both cases, the project is grew in an anniversary who raised the national identity question. According to Mark Rice in his study through the lens of the city, the creation of the NEA photographic grant survey, sorry, NEA photographic survey grant category between 1976 and 1981 rooted in the debates surrounding the American Bicentennial Photography and Film Project started in 1975. This one puts photography in the zeitgeist and prints the need of visual exploration of the nation and its transformation. From this point, the dozen surveys reported by the NEA manifest a great deal of diversity, and the result is a fractured vision of American society, a reflection in a broken mirror that resists any totalizing conclusions. The New Mexico Photographic Survey is a piece of the puzzle formed by these surveys one of the last added in 1981. The project of Data Photographic Mission, launched just two years later in France, shared with the NEA Photographic Survey Grand Category National Ambition and Political Concern. The project is supported this time by an institution dedicated to territorial issues. This is the Delegation for National and Regional Development and Regional Action created in 1963 to conduct a cross-action cross aimed mainly at restoring imbalances between Paris and the French province and between regions. It is distinguished by a project policy 
with targeted and timely intervention and innovative methods. The launch of a public commission addressed to photographers is part of this action. Like the NEA, it is to initiate a decentralized movement with the implementation of partnership with other institutions. Launch on the occasion of the celebration of the 20th anniversary of the expedition, the mission aims at providing a sort of critical assessment of the action form of the art in France. What does our country look like today? Despite different institutional and geographical context, it is basically the same question that are at the origin of these two projects. It is to ask photography to reveal the contemporary territory, the everyday landscape. Both projects are at the crossroads of a territory in search of identity and a photography <laughs> in search of rodent mission. There is the second part of my analysis, focus on the role assigned to the photographer. <coughs> During my talk, I will show you an extract from photographer's work construed as a dialogue between the two projects. I apologize, I don't have the time to comment each one of them, but I will give you an ID. It will give you an ID, and we can come back to the images in further discussion. <coughs> So every photographic campaign helps shape perception of, about the place represented to build a new truth. Consequently, every aesthetic decision a photographer makes is simultaneously a social and political statement. For the mission of Datar and the New Mexico Photographic Survey, the challenge is to convey photography as much for this social involvement as for its artistic dimension. Indeed, in the two projects, the photographers are considered as artists. They enjoy a great freedom of choice in how they experience the territory and represent the landscape. In this time, the United States has incorporated photography, artistic, and cultural institutions. Going forward, the creation of the photographic survey category grant by the NEA shows a willingness to develop a fine art policy in which the photography is clearly involved. The New Mexico Photographic Survey exemplifies this view. Indeed, the director of the project, Stephen Yates, began in 1918, the first corrector of photography at the Museum of New Mexico. Through the survey, he desired to encourage and support individual working methods of each photographer and allow their ideas to grow over several years or months. Consequently, the result is marked by a great stylistic openness. It's the opposite for the data photographic mission, which is itself actively participating in the recognition of the artistic statue of photography in the 1980s in France. The mission differs from the traditional use by claiming the statue of artists for photographers and the quality of artworks for photographs. It shows an involved dimension, almost militant, and the two directors of the mission, Bernard Latager and Proctor S, are committed to the freedom of the spirit and tone to, of the photographers, who work without constraint of the subject or the result. They assist them over several months or years to develop their own discourse on the territory and the landscape. Straight away, consider works of art. The images taken by photographers must, however, fulfill a social role. They must participate in the development of an identity of these territories. They must make possible to represent the new landscape. The principle of the survey as a mission is to contribute to shift the line, work at a symbolic and imaginary appropriation of contemporary landscape. The lighting idea is to present documentary quality of artistic proposal, which means the ability to tell the real, to represent the social and economic relations, the relations to the, to the territory just as well, if not better, than the qualified picture of document. The photographer has doubly invest in this work, as creator, as artist, 
but also in their personal experiences. Many of the work were intimate examination of places to which the photographers have deep connection. The investment of the image by the subjectivity does not invalidate its ability to be the witness of the time. Instead, it makes the photograph closer to its subject, more accurate about it. It is on this condition, in this experience du paysage, as Ernst and Lacarget insist on, that photography will be able to make a portrait of its time. In this way, the NEA encourages photographers to creatively explore this documentary dimension of art. Similarly, the tension between art and document is found in the discussion about the data mission. The two directors are friends of desire to produce image, I quote, whose documentary value and artistic value are based on one another. So in both projects, survey, just like mission, photographs participate in the construction of a discourse and dialogue in this regard with other thinkers of landscape that are writers, historians, or cultural geographers. First, Stephen Yates, associate from the beginning John Breckenall Jackson. It is also for this reason that Auguste Lambert is invited to comment the work of the mission of the data. the relationship each terrorist has with the images, I'd like to return briefly to the chronological positioning of this project within the broader scope of the landscape reflection. The New Mexico Photographic Survey marks a form of climax of a time. The era of the 1970s in the US marked by the rise of cultural geography. I don't come back to this part, it was already largely explained this past few days. To the contrary, the data photographic mission occupies a pivotal and innovative role, initiating in the 1980s decade, decade, which was a period of artistic and cultural renewal in the old continent. It campaigns for the entry of photography on the art scene and she leads precursory reflection on the landscape. Third, also they are happening in the dawn of the 1980s. The two projects are therefore part of different timescales in terms of thinking of the landscape. The New Mexico Photographic Survey come, comes an, as an outcome, while the data mission acts as a pioneer. This disparity is particularly noticeable in the nature of the dialogue established between geographer and photographer. First, their arrival in the project is not the same. Jackson is associated with the original project. Weinberg is requested for final writing in the catalog. The catalog survey, the essential landscape, embodies in its page the relation between Jackson and photographers. <coughs> he alternates the publication of essay with pictures <coughs> such as the development of a common reflection on the territory of the landscape of New Mexico, but with a prominent place given to the tourists. His work introduces all the work when you have to go to the end of the volume in order to have an overview of the series made by the photographers. It may be the embodiment of what Paul Gross told us yesterday. I quote, first have a thing and then connect to images. <coughs> End quote. The data photographic mission catalog containing Baird's writing is a concluding publication in 89. It is organized from a portfolio model. The pictures are organized by the author the photographs are published in full page, framed by short text. Auguste Lambert's essay, 
the thousand birds of the landscape, is as a comment that enlightens the art of the book, the photographs. To punctuate the text, some view are reported in small size. If we rely on the layout, the link between reflection of Auguste Humbert and data photographic production seems narrower compared to the text and that just seems to juxtapose itself to the work of photographers. When Auguste Humbert regularly quotes pictures of the mission, Jackson never made direct reference to the photographs, an appearance that can be partially misleading. Indeed, Auguste Humbert requested once the work completed is positioning itself as iconographer. He selects isolated images and seems to not to take into account photographers' complete work and qualified, qualified each picture. For John B. Jackson, the relationship is less illustrative. Jackson's text, looking at New Mexico, which starts the book and is a unique and original, seems more steep by photographs of the survey, even though it does not explicitly mention them. Jackson returns to the history of New Mexico by a photographic evocation of the landscape. He associates each great period in a visual and colorful description. The work of photographers are clearly an echo of Jackson's work on the landscape of New Mexico. This almost symbiotic relationship between Jackson's work and photographers' pictures, and Michael Thomas told us about this morning, is probably the result of an already long story between the two. To conclude, I have to go back to my original question. Is American survey or American survey the same as French mission? The analysis conducted here underlines obviously many similarities. They emerge in a similar historical context, marked by disorientation and the will to rehabilitate vernacular and everyday landscapes. Each time it is a question of choosing to value the sensible way by giving the photographer the responsibility to renegotiate the relationship to the territory. Both assign a social function to the photography promoted to the rank of art. Also one is initiated by an art institution and the other by a public planning institution. These two projects clearly have as common denominator their political ambition. They aim at proposing a new representation system for rebirth of the landscape. <coughs> the similarities of the states of the statue granted to photography and the links with the landscape question seem to advocate for an analogy between surveys and missions. These public commissions are both part of a landscape policy. I insist and propose on the concept period. Indeed, despite the common vocabulary, I consider that it does not vary. Indeed, despite the common vocabulary, I consider that it does not seem appropriate to make an historical shortcut generalizing the results of this analysis to the survey and mission from the 19th century. I think, for instance, about the French Mission Geographic or the four great American surveys for the most known example. These projects are regularly quoted as historical background for surveys and missions of the second part of the 20th century, wrongly in my opinion. The objective of such comparison is often to legitimize and take root in an established tradition. There is an important difference in terms of given status and given role to photography in the 19th century public commission. In the 19th century, photography is considered as a document, as to be transparent, and photographer considered as operator. Also, one can retrospectively reconsider the quality and the value attached to the images. 
This comes from a contemporary re-reading, I think. At the time, the goal was to make an inventory of the territory and its natural resources in order to extend the political landscape. <coughs> this public commission was not participating to a landscape policy, but to the reinforcement of the political landscape. So if survey and mission are, to my opinion, the same across the ocean, a straight line cannot be drawn between the centuries. Surveys and missions are comparable only when they remain in similar historical context. Thank you for your attention. of landscape photography and witnessing might have been a better title for this talk than looking and seeing. But as painter Ed Reinhardt said, art teaches people how to see. And add that to Dorothea Lange's famous dictum, a camera is a tool for learning how to see without a camera. My own focus on post-pastoral photography or on land use rather than landscape is bereft of any technical knowledge. This photograph is by Joan Myers. It's a power plant in New Mexico near Floco. I look for image and content and context. I've spent most of my life advocating for art that escapes the art world and elopes with life. I'm interested in the ways that images can illuminate places, expose what's happening in and to places, and perhaps offer tools for change or at least remediation in places that need help. This is by Rick Dingus. It's the Texas Plains. I think it's the Young the Cabo. <clears throat> and that, alas, places that need help, is a great deal of the American West. It's been said that in the West, nature is politics, and politics is nature. Landscape is broadened to incorporate land use, land ownership, and New Mexicans are active in the growing movement to try and to stitch the West back together by collaboratively developing new strategies with ranchers, bureaucrats, scientists, and environmentalists. What Courtney White of the Kibera Coalition has called a radical center. And art belongs in that list. This is by Peter Gowen. It's the Sedan Crater in the Nevada test site, nuclear test site. As we teeter on the edge of the cliff defined by the Anthropocene, long-term thinking is in short supply. If shallow change is all we can manage, we'd all be more vulnerable to the deep change that's coming down the pike. The hot breath of climate change is giving landscape photography a new sense of purpose. And the effects of global warming are most visible in sparsely populated areas like the West. Landscape itself is almost by definition context, including history, social space, and politics. J.B. Jackson wrote that no landscape vernacular or otherwise can be comprehended unless we perceive it as an organization of space, unless we ask ourselves who owns or uses those spaces, how they were created, and how they change. And he described the cultural landscape as a concrete, three-dimensional, shared reality. After hearing, seeing the films last night and hearing all the talks today, I wanted to completely rewrite this, but I didn't get a chance. <laughs> this is by Michael Light. It's the highway interchange in Mesa, Arizona. I like to think in terms of ripple effects, content that begins from a center, from the local, from a very specific place, and then moves on out to confront all the issues, water rights, private property, public domain, the relics of colonialism and ongoing corporate expansion. For years, I've been claiming that critical landscape photography can be an activist tool or aid in this process. 
And so I thought maybe it was time to scrutinize this notion. This is by Carol Gallagher from her groundbreaking book, American Ground Zero, about where she lived for several years downwind of the Nevada test site. This is a playground, in, a deserted playground in Amargosa, Amargosa, Nevada, or Utah. So what I mean by critical landscape photography is not what Bill Fox has described as an advertisement for nature, but work that's activist in itself, or more likely parallels activism as an ally in exposing the details of a forgotten or endangered place or destructive activities in the region. These details range from micro to macro, from local cultural resources to global climate change. One aspect of critical landscape photography is self-criticism, which can include, alas, self-censorship. I'm teaching in Wyoming at the moment, and apparently there's no climate change in that very conservative state. <laughs> How nice for them. This is a photograph, uh, a sign outside of Canyon de Chelly in the Navajo Nation. Photographers and writers, too, have to ask ourselves, what are we doing here? The bottom line is that you can't own a place, you can't belong to it, and maybe you shouldn't even be taking pictures of it, unless you're also taking some responsibility for what happens to it. <laughs> and among these responsibilities in the West is consideration of indigenous rights. This is by Jose Tsunajini, who is the Navajo Dine, speaks for itself. I'm talking about a kind of photographic paysage moralisé, to borrow a term from art history. All the contemporary arts, but especially photography, which is aligned simultaneously with both reality and creativity, must confront various ethical balancing acts. This is by Patrick Gagatani, who happens to live here. It's uranium tailings left by the Anaconda Corporation at Laguna Pueblo near here. So many of these works convey a moral conviction, even a judgment on greed's destruction of what we call nature, which of course includes humans. Does this undermine their artistic power? I certainly don't think so. Esthetes will ask, but is it art? I say, who cares? Uh, this is by Matt Black from a fairly recent project called The Geography of Poverty, done all over the United States. This is from Hosmer, South Dakota, which has a population of 208, and 28% of whom are living in poverty. Walker Evans once said, art is never a document, but it can adopt that style. It's tricky and often interesting to endow documents with too much aesthetic interest, foggy focus, quirky angles, weird color. But it's perfectly possible to make visually impressive works embedded in a social context. For example, here's a lovely, almost abstract photograph by Sharon Stewart of water rushing through an acequia in northern New Mexico. That's an ito. It can stand alone, but it becomes far more meaningful when it takes its place in her series on the village, its people, and their relationship to their ditches and farmlands over a span of years. This is by Deborah Ford, so the border of Wyoming and Montana, Shoshone land. Obviously, no single photographic strategy can outline the deeper causes and repercussions in such a shifting landscape. It's often the use of the image as much as the image itself that makes it effective. And the powers that be know this. Wyoming's recent data trespass bill makes it illegal to photograph nature including proof of pollution or any destructive practices, and share it with any governmental agency without permission from the landowners. This is an unconstitutional ban on citizen science and art, and it's being challenged by environmentalist organizations. Would it affect this image by Deborah Ford of Indian lands in Wyoming? They haven't figured that one out yet. This is by Shabankar Banerjee, who I think is either has just been here or is just about to come here. It's a, a tundra in the Arctic uh, with, tra fire, with tracks across it that mark where oil exploration has been taking place, even though this was supposedly protected land. The uh, <coughs> Bush younger administration decided to just go ahead and do it. Some photographers are more interested in exposing critical or crucial political land use issues and in challenging the medium aesthetically or treating 
creating a marketable individual style. For instance, Banerjee declares himself an activist first and an artist second. His striking photographs of the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge were used as testimony during the congressional debates about drilling for fossil fuels in the refuge a few years ago. They were also to be featured in the Smithsonian. Abruptly, his exhibition was kicked downstairs and its explanatory captions were censored. Decontextualized and even the most powerful pictures tend to lose their teeth. This is by Wanda Hammerbeck, Order, Absence, and Presence. Yet landscape photographs are often so generalized that without the aid of captions, we have no idea what part of the world we're seeing and how it got that way. Ultimately, words and images together offer ways to integrate one's own imaginings of life into those of a polity. An untitled, uncaptioned, deracinated photograph, no matter how visually interesting, is deprived of its activist potential, maybe because its maker is primarily interested in form, or because she or he has decided that specificity would detract from its status as high art. Though we no longer see photography as truth, it still conveys information and first-hand experience, lived experience, like no other medium. This is by Caroline Hinckley. This is Western Tibet, <laughs> not Western New Mexico. Uh, I, I put this in because she was the one who introduced me to J.B. Jackson in the mid-80s. Of course, like everyone else, I always enjoy beautiful, isolated images. I admit to being deeply moved by that iconic polar bear clinging to a melting iceberg and to a certain fondness for what some see as wallpaper. Seductive pictures that are all inspiring in their strangeness, their melancholy evocation of what we have to lose. There was a conference in Montreal in 2014 called Et si la beauté pouvait sauver le monde? What if beauty could save the world? An alternative to the myth of progress. Many believe that beauty alone can powerfully convey difficult ideas by engaging people when they might otherwise look away. Environmental organizations use landscape photographs like this often. Uh, how is that? It really looks like hell, doesn't it? <laughs> I got this off the internet looking for a, an example of this. <laughs> uh, they use landscape photographs to emphasize the necessity to preserve beauty, but the American West's inherently dramatic vistas too often become eco porn merely melodramatic, floating off into calendar land on the wings of two blue skies, two red rocks, two filtered clouds. And this is what you're supposed to be doing. For over a century, such beautiful and often banal images have been successfully employed to grease the wheels of manifest destiny. But they've also been effective weapons in the ongoing battles to preserve what's left of wilderness and habitat. When push comes to shove in battles on behalf of the land, nothing can beat contextualization, <coughs> social narratives, mobility and change, and engagement with local issues. This is just a picture I took last week of the snowy range in Wyoming. This is uh, by Cluey, uh, Center for Land Use Interpretation, Wyoming Coal Train. The major Innovator of this shift of focus from landscape to land use is Cluey, the LA-based center, and my favorite example of a new conceptual landscape art, or not art. But you've been privileged to hear about it firsthand yesterday from Matthew Coolidge, so I won't go on and on. Photography can be an effective tool in environmental battles, but it can also be implicated in the failure to articulate the social importance of landscape and land use to reach those who still can't see. I often quote Robert Adams, whose work this is, whose serial approach and with those of others gave landscape pho photography a new social life. In 1980, he wrote, what a landscape photographer traditionally tries to do is show what is past, present, and future at once. You want ghosts and the daily news and prophecy. It's presumptuous and ridiculous. You fail all the time. These images are from his Turning Back project about clear cuts in Coast, Coast County, Oregon. But failure is rarely acknowledged in activist projects. It's too depressing. We're losing too many battles already. We cling to the desperate hope that we're making a difference. And sometimes we are. The battle between aesthetics and reportage 
in landscape photography is an old one that has yet to be resolved, and that Rafael mentioned as well. This is a good thing since it forces artists, critics, and environmentalists to carefully consider the images they offer and to what ends. It's intriguing in that most of the effective, the most of the effective images of the human-made landscape don't include people, Miguel notwithstanding, though their absence can be made telling. Said Trail of Thirst, the Lalo Montoya series on the U.S.-Mexico border, is most, what you see here, is most moving and least intrusive when the desperate immigrants are invisible. This also applies to series about empty places where tragic events happen, like Joel Sternfeld's On This Site, where murders and ghastly things happen, Drex Brooks Sweet Medicine, where mainly massacres of Native people happen, or John Fall. This is from his New Mexico series of archaeological sites that were buried under reservoirs. So that all we have left is the lab of anthropology numbers, the LA numbers, to remind us of them. In these mysterious and evocative images, the ambiguity is swept away only by the captions, providing a context the images would hold. This is by Michael Berman, it's a Wyoming wheat field. I see the photograph as a field rather than an artifact suggesting sequence, layers, and periphery. One of the choices critical landscape photographers have to make is between the long view and closer perusal. The short view is often short-changed. The long view, the vista, the view from on high, is most common and most popular, in part due to the inescapably reductive or at least subtractive aspect of landscape photography, which people have also been talking about. Distance can provide perspective in every sense of the word. The challenge lies in framing distant vastness. I particularly admire the way many contemporary photographers can make what at first glance looks like nothing look like something we should have noticed, and I include Frank Golke, Ed Rennie, Joe Deal. Photography, along with drones, has, which we actually heard about people using drones in the landscape of the has been, become an activist strategy, providing a literal overview of the scale of blight that can be staggering. This is Church Rock in New Mexico. In 1979, a uranium mining dam breached in Church Rock, which is on the Navajo Nation, releasing 90 million gallons of radioactive waste into the aptly named Rio Cuerco, Dirty River and contaminating drinking water to this day. It received a lot less attention at the time than the infamous Three Mile Island, and less than the EPA's oops moment on the Animus and San Juan just a couple of months ago, which is also devastating the Navajo Nation, though Church Rock was a far greater disaster than either one. From a temporal distance, Will Wilson, who I mentioned, uh, his autoimmune response series depicts the quixotic relationship between a post-apocalyptic Diné man, the artist, and the devastatingly beautiful but toxic environment he inhabits. That's a quote from Will. This is by Louis Helbig, a Canadian photographer who's been concentrating on the Alberta tar sands. Photographs on the, of wounds on the land, vast strip mines, mountaintop removal, toxic ponds, can be dramatic, even beautiful, providing another challenge for critical photographers who struggle with the beauty of ugliness. Some are accused of aestheticizing disaster. At the same time, it seems kind of counterproductive to make uninteresting images without pressing problems. <laughs> we also have to ask if images of these lethal situations or places are being normalized by photography. Are they becoming cliches like the flowering meadows or mountain vistas or school massacres? Max Kozlov addressed this in his prescient 1991 article titled Ghastly News from Epic Landscapes. He says, landscape photographers who want to make a statement about the deadening of the environment find that they must steel themselves against ingratiation while somehow affirming the value of their abused subject. End of quote. So those who choose beauty for this subject matter are most effective when they're also aware of the flip side, when their choice of beauty is a conscious means to counter brutality. 
One of the most socially effective environmental photography projects that I know is Chris Jordan's series, Running the Numbers, an American Self-Portrait. It's based on a very simple idea, fusing image and information into a double whammy. Jordan, as a former lawyer, photographed hundreds of objects like tossed out plastic bottles or office papers or SUVs, digitally multiplied them to represent thousands or millions, and then titled the huge, perversely beautiful, almost abstract images with numbers that bring them down to earth and into our faces. For instance, this is Jordan's Denali Denial, which seemed at first glance to be a big, pixelated, quite ordinary black and white photograph of, a gig of the gigantic Alaskan mountain, finally being what it should be, and its melting glaciers. But on closer perusal, the image is constituted of the word denial and the logo of the GMC Yukon Denali. <laughs> Ansel Adams, this is not. The title informs the viewer that the photograph's 24,000 logos represent six weeks of sales of the SUV in 2004. Jordan says the photographs speak to the relationship of the individual and the collective, and also the relationship between the near and the far. This is by Jacques Garnier. Or Jack Garnier, obviously, he's American. Uh, is this landscape photography? Yes, it's a conceptualized landscape where we all live. It subverts the veritable tsunami of decontextualized cultural knowledge in advertising, TV, and the internet. There's no time to get into the effect of Google Earth, GPS, GIS, LIDAR, and so on have had on the new landscape photography, and it was brought up briefly at one point. But we have to wonder, do they make art as we know it irrelevant? Art can't change the world alone but it's an important ally to those challenging power with unconventional solutions. The ultimate frame photographers need to address is that imposed by society itself, as social justice is eroded just like our gully area landscape. Thank you. <laughs>
we were matra local until our removal. I had announced my tribal towns earlier. So with that, there's this notion of Indian land being takeable, and then also maps on to indigenous women being rapeable. And Andrea Smith talks about that, which leads into a couple of uh, really difficult moments that we're going through in North America right now. One of them is related to missing and murdered indigenous women in Canada. The other is um, related to, to border town violence against indigenous people in the United States. Um, the other is related to Black Lives Matter and police violence against people of color. Um, the other would probably be um, the murders of citizens in Mexico. So thinking through those, but I want to give you a chance to translate that. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> let, me, let me put on my specs for you. Um, so, um, Loha is a girl at the end. Um, the girl at the end. The girl at the end. The girl at the end. De la photographie. Uh, il a dit les politiques de photographie, critique de photographie, à un geste d'amour. Uh, et uh, donc Laura est d'accord avec cela, que la critique en fait implique la communication uh, et des pratiques uh, culturelles. Et elle aimerait bien souligner la question de l'intention. Hein, que la qualité intentionnalité, l'intentionnalité, si ce mot existe en okay. français. Uh, et uh, le lien entre l'intention et. Et um, elle a aussi commencé à réfléchir à sur, uh, sur la politique impliquée par la notion de l'intentionnalité ou de l'intention. Uh, uh, la question de l'auteur euh, et du pouvoir. Et euh, elle aimerait lier ça à cette question de l'amoncellement euh, de, de la terre, euh, euh, qui est aussi liée à la question du secteur colonialisme. Donc, c'est un colonialisme, euh, euh, c'est le colonialisme de l'occupant. Elle aimerait aussi soulever la question de la terre euh, euh, ou des terres indigènes, des terres indiennes, et euh, comment ces terres sont configurées comme, euh, comme, comme quelque chose qui peut se prendre très facilement. Et c'est aussi, en, et cela euh, raconte aussi avec la question d'une femme comme, euh, comme capable d'être violée. Hein? Et euh, cela euh, l'amène à une réflexion sur les femmes euh, 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 assassinées, euh, des femmes qui sont absentes, des femmes qui ont disparu. Euh, et euh, cela euh, l'amène aussi à la question de la violence de la femme de la police et, euh, et aux frontières. Voilà. Griffo and Lepard both talk about this notion of identity of place. So there are multiple subjectivities at work on the landscape based on race, class, gender, and with police violence, with violence against women, we can think of this in terms of landscapes of fear. And how is one to capture a landscape of fear? So then in some cases we see an absence from landscape photography and a story that's never told is a story that's never known. So then my question that I pose to our speakers then is how do we include multiple subjectivities or multiple subject positions? How do we make the photography methods, the approach available to a broader audience so that they can tell their story? Oh, um. 
Donc la question principale, c'est euh, comment faire de la place pour les subjectivités multiples dans les affaires Il est vrai que dans l'émission de survey que j'ai présentée, cette question classe, genre de la race, en tout cas, n'est pas, pas présente du côté français, ce ne sont pas des problématiques de cette époque en France. Par contre, la façon dont on peut définir une identité, le choix qui est fait à chaque fois, c'est ce que je trouve intéressant c'est de dire qu'un photographe ne peut pas donner toute l'identité d'un territoire, d'un paysage, que c'est plusieurs photographes, 12, 29, euh, qui vont par la, la mosaïque de leur regard, par la diversité de leur regard, commencer à offrir euh, un, un ensemble qui peut commencer à, à donner une idée de l'identité l'idée de la mosaïque, de la diversité, qui est très présente. But uh, this question you, you ask about how to uh, show an identity with a picture. Uh, each time the choice is to say it's not through a picture but multiple series of pictures and not through a, a photographer eyes but through multiple photographer eyes. So they, they are 12 or uh, 29 or several photographers who work on, on one territory to uh, give several uh, point of view and that was all this point of view together to try to propose and um, so far I don't know. I think that relate to what you were saying about uh, photography can talk for itself in that it has a context to talk about. <coughs> yeah, I mean, I, don't, I wonder how many Americans actually look to the landscape for identity. Very, very few, I suspect. I mean, and they don't think of urban landscapes as being landscapes. So that's another problem. Native people do identify with the land, I think, in a very different way. And then comes that whole thing about is the land female? Is it Mother Earth? Is is uh, there's a lot of argument, nature nurture stuff about that that we <laughs> don't have to get into at the moment. But uh, that's it's it's really interesting. I mean, one criticism I would have of, of Jackson's work is that. There seems to be very, maybe I just don't know enough about it, but there's n very little mention of any native presence. Mm -hmm. Is there? Is it there? Yeah, I mean, he has essays from early on in the landscape about uh, Pueblo. Uh, yeah, Pueblo, yeah, Pueblo, yeah, Because yeah. yeah. New Mexico is, is different, and we have to constantly remind ourselves <coughs> that this is part of, it, that, you know, as if, well, maybe it's not, as Jimmy Durham, a great American, Native artist who refuses to be called native anymore uh, said, "We are not part of your cultural her of your rich cultural heritage." <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that has always amused me because we we do tend to sort of claim native identity as part of, if we remember to do that, which is often we just don't remember. We say, "Oh, when it began, when the Spanish came, or whatever." I've, I've been finding that in people's talks, not here, but recently, a few things I've heard, it's, it's as though Native people never existed, and this is in Wyoming where there's a, a very large reservation and so forth, so, so obviously power, agency, is, is part of uh, the identity with women and the natural local aspect of it is another sort of fascinating part that I haven't thought of. La première question posée par Lucy, c'est que elle se demande combien d'Américains en fait regardent vers les paysages pour retrouver leur identité. Et elle, voilà, la deuxième. 
cela en fait soulève la question euh, des Américains euh, indigènes, euh, les Amérindiens, euh, et comment on euh, voit le paysage, euh, est-ce qu'on le code féminin, euh, masculin, etc. Et elle reconnaît le fait que euh, chez Jackson peut-être, qu'il n'y a vraiment pas de présence indigène, et elle a posé la question à M. Wilson, qui a répondu en fait oui, dans les premières photographies, il est arrivé à inscrire cette euh, présence. Et euh, euh, Lucie en fait a répondu euh, euh, en, euh, par une toute petite boutade, euh, 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 le fait que les Amérindiens disent, nous ne font pas partie de votre héritage euh, euh, culturel euh, riche. Euh, donc, Okay, and one last sort of statement and follow-up question, and it relates to Bertho's, um, my reading of, of her reading, <laughs> not to get all Coolidge on everybody, um, political, <laughs> political landscape, and what does the country look like today? So, in thinking about political landscape, it's almost, it, there's an erasure of something there, of all these indigenous nations, when you start thinking of the U.S., and I'm just speaking from a U.S. context, when you think of the U.S. as a container to document without sort of asserting this notion of indigenous nations dwelling in those spaces as well. Um, so then there's this way that the nation state apparatus gets reified through, that it, it has a potential to get reified around this idea of American exceptionalism with the frontier myth. And I'm not saying that, I'm not reading these as that because I haven't looked at the collection, but that's sort of the first thing that pops into my head. And this idea then with frontier myth that and the idea of exceptionalism, and there are already indigenous people there, then are they exceptional as well for existing in those spaces? And then the other thing that Bertho um, suggests is a politic of landscape, which I really love both of these, political landscape and politic of the landscape, and thinking of the political economy of place. So what do, if we look and think about landscape, and we read landscape, what are the cultural, political, and economic spheres at work? And so Lepard urges us to look at this critically as well, to look at what processes create place and think through disrupting larger processes of oppression through the use of photographic interventions. So then um, I guess my question is around the politic of landscape, what is one's ethical obligation as a photographer then, when you photograph the landscape and those cultural, political, and economic spheres and representing them? So, um, well, I'm going to uh, cut to the chase. And, uh, so I, I, I think that Laura would, uh, would like to sort of play upon, uh, oh, pardon, pardon. <laughs> C'est votre notion du paysage politique et d'une politique de paysage. Et la question c'est, quelles, quelles sont les obligations éthiques du photographe vis-à-vis -vis du paysage I mean, it's hard. It's hard for me as a writer to tell photographers what to do. So I, I, I look at the images and I read them, and they're they're mostly doing what I'd like them to do. The ones I used here. I mean, they, they are communicating to us not only what the land looks like and how it was formed, or how it was not geologically formed, but culturally formed or socially formed, and then they're telling us what they think of it. Uh, I think sometimes that part of it doesn't come across as strongly as it could. It's, it's difficult to 
especially in one image. I mean, I don't do any of these photographers any favors by showing one image. Because as I say, I think of it as a field, I think of it as sequential, I think of the peripheries, and, and other people have said the same thing. So it's uh, what the photographer's obligation to me seems to be is to, to communicate. Mm -hmm. Donc, euh, Lucie reconnaît qu'il est très difficile de dire aux photographes ce qu'ils devraient faire. Hein? Et euh, euh, ils essaient de nous dire euh, ce qu'ils pensent du paysage, mais c'est difficile à faire. Et euh, donc, pour cette question de l'obligation éthique, c'est simple. Il faut communiquer. Voilà leur obligation. Um. Je suis un, euh, ma réponse va être euh, la même que celle de Lucie, mais il me semble que c'est une question qui s'adresse plus au photographe de même euh, et de la même façon. Euh, J'ai euh, un grand respect pour, pour les photographes et leur travail. Je pense que euh, ce que nous disait euh, ce matin Samuel Delcourt et Michael Gander, c'est cette question d'être le plus en accord avec l'espace, cette couverture qu'il cherche à avoir avec le paysage qu'il photographie et ce respect dont il témoigne dans leurs images, en même temps qu'il s'y investissent, c'est la position éthique beaucoup de photographes qui effectivement souvent expriment leur pensée du paysage, non pas en une image, mais dans le développement de plusieurs images d'une série est une proposition politique. Vous voulez essayer Non. Je ne sais pas si vous avez un peu de temps. Je ne sais pas si vous avez un peu de temps. Je ne sais pas The only thing I can say is that I have a respect for so much photographer, I, I trust them to, to do what Sadin Delcourt and my daughter have explained us this morning. So to be respectful of what they know, where they are, and uh, to be involved in the images they are, uh, they make, and, and to try to understand in the best way, in their way, in their own way, what they feel. <coughs> communicate it through no one image, as you say, but through several images who work together. I've done the same, I just on the one image, but it was like a taste of it, and I really apologize to have done that, but uh, uh, I do not uh, want to choose one or another, so uh, but the same way. We have the uh, best ethical uh, position is for us to respect the work of photographer, to be to, to trust them, to do that. Can, can I add one more thing? Sure. One thing I, I should have also said is it's great if the photographer wants to communicate and if, if he or she feels obligated to communicate, but the next step is maybe even more important, which is getting it out. As I said, the use of the image is often as important as the image itself. And getting it out uh, in, within the art world is a whole problematic process, which involves self-censorship, ass-kissing, all kinds of things that uh, nobody really wants to think about or, or, no, or wants to do. But often, all of us do it. <laughs> this is the way to get the images out. So how do you get, get your work to be seen, to communicate with people, and to educate people is, is another main part of the puzzle and the really difficult one. Yeah. Um. La réponse est très simple. Um, pour Lucie, il s'agit de, uh, de rendre visible l'image. Et c'est la tâche, uh, uh, so that would be the task of the photographer. For you to try and get the image. Well, unfortunately, it is the task of the photographer. Or is it her agent? Okay. Malheureusement, c'est bien la tâche du photographe rendre visible son image, distribuer son image, faire circuler son image, ses images. Okay. So.
So I just want to finish it up with this, this section with a couple of sentences. And that's that I'm thinking of how maybe photo documentation by the broad, like say indigenous community, can be used to document and used in anti-oppression activities. So I'd love to have a conversation with folks over that. Um, I apologize, I didn't mean to get into like art style kind of documentation, but we can talk about that later. Um, how would you? Would you like to? Yeah, let's open that up for questions now. Um, I don't know if you've seen it, but NASA has released a series of photos, The Earth is Art, and, and they're pictures from all over the world, and very, very beautiful pictures, but taken by satellites. And I'm just kind of wondering, because that takes the photographer completely out of the picture um, when, when looking at these glaciers and alluvial fans and such, uh, when taken by a satellite, no one can comment. Et donc la question c'est, euh, euh, Madame s'interroge sur la diffusion des images par la NASA, euh, euh, que la Terre en fait, euh, que la Terre est de là. Et la question c'est, est-ce que c'est un risque d'enlever le photographe euh, de l'image, de la photographie? What you mentioned, uh, the in the uh, landscape architecture photography that these satellites were taken by satellites and not by people. So it is a, it's a fascinating subject. There's a book by James Nisbet about land art that, that spends a great deal of time on the whole notion of the whole earth and the whole earth catalog. <coughs> the effect of, of that, not on photography so much, it's just on, on the way we see, period. I'm, I'm a lot I, I can barely get on the internet. I, I wasn't raised with television, so I'm the wrong person to ask about all of that part of it. But um, it's it's a fascinating. I haven't seen this this thing, but it's a fascinating moment. But yeah, that's that's far away. I mean, I, I'm really interested in close-ups as much as anything. I mean, a, a, the this this ripple effect thing, where where you you might end up with those pictures, but you got to start with where you are and with your own lived experience. So that's, that's to me, more important. And I don't think satellites can do that yet. I mean, we have all kinds of, like, you know, these, these wildlife photographs that happen in the woods in the middle of the night and you suddenly get a coyote looking. <laughs> those are pretty fascinating, and I know some artists who have worked with that in very interesting ways, where they didn't actually take the pictures themselves, but they worked with it, so. <coughs> Donc, pour paraphraser rapidement, euh, euh, Lucie a dit euh, que dans la mesure où ces images ont été prises euh, par des satellites, euh, effectivement, euh, que ça la risque d'enlever le, euh, le photographe euh, du processus. Euh, et elle a fait référence à, 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 à un ouvrage de James Nesbitt pour le euh, le catalogue de toute la terre. Euh, voilà. Et euh, pour elle-même, elle préfère des gros euh, ce, ce sont des gros points qui, qui, qui l'intéressent. Et donc, selon elle, il faut toujours commencer par là où on est. Ce, ce qu'un qu satellite ne peut pas faire. Ah, oui, oui. Okay. Oh, and yeah, I just have a question. That, sorry, go ahead. About what like, you were talking about activism and like getting your work out and into a nice gallery in New York or LA does not necessarily it's not necessarily an act of activism. And most art artists are not activists. It's like not something you're necessarily taught to do. Most artists are very interested in getting like this right now, like getting reviewed by by you, by you, for example, an art form or something like that. I so, haven't written reviews for about forty years. So. Oh, okay. <laughs> but I'm just saying. So art, but, but activism is this strange animal for the vast majority of artists, contemporary, native, non-native, 
if you could just comment on how do you make that leap of faith into activism first, potentially, and then your art will flow from that. No, I think art starts in the studio. I mean, you know, there's no art that doesn't start in the head of the person, the lived experience, the, the uh, past associations or associations, just visual associations and so forth. But we, and you're absolutely right that we don't teach um, in any, very few art schools in the country, teach that you should even think about being an activist. Uh, and it's, it's kind of a dirty word in the art world anyway. It's not really used that much. Because I mean, I've worked with activists for, for 40 years or so, and usually if, if people say, well, of course he's an activist, which means not really a, she is not really a real artist, because it's, this other stuff comes first. I think Shabaka Banerjee disproves that uh, with a vengeance. He's, he's really a really <coughs> photographer, but he's, he, would prefer, he prefers to be an activist. But I wish we taught that in schools. I mean, art and social practice and so forth is, is, is there slightly now, but I, I'm teaching in a, a class where I say the stuff I say, and, and the students say, well, we, nobody ever told us that, which is very sad. It, 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 that bridge between the artist and the rest of the world has, has been broken for a long time. <laughs> Donc ma question était que les artistes en général euh, ne sont jamais formés à être des, euh, des activistes. Euh, Est-ce qu'on dit ça en français euh, Pas des mais merci. Donc euh, comment en effet réconcilier cette euh, question du militantisme politique et en pratique esthétique Et euh, selon Lucy, tout a en fait commence dans un studio et commence dans une expérience vécue. Elle reconnaît que c'est une, que une uh, que question boiteuse, uh, uh, difficile, uh, que, que le militantisme est en effet à sa à mon sein. Uh, uh, mais uh, un artiste comme Banerjee, d'accord, uh, montre clairement que que pratique esthétique et militantisme peuvent euh, euh, se marier en effet. Et euh, elle reconnaît aussi que le pont a été que le lien entre euh, et militantisme et politique et politique. So it's an individual who is showing what he sees the future to be in the question of air pollution. It's done in a very graphic, sort of fashionable way. But he is kind of being vocal as an art of our artist who is active. Oh yeah, yeah, there are a lot of people out there who are listening, listening people. <laughs> There's actually a whole generation of students coming out of IAIA that really have a sensibility like that. Yeah. I have some of my best friends are Protestants. And, and I, I don't know any of them who wouldn't on some level consider themselves activists in some way. So it's a very broad genetic cast uh, and I think none ignores some sort of response and responsibility towards social connection. Some are big banners, some are small, small. And uh, all of them, including myself, uh, feel uh, as though we respond to the best we can to the world we find ourselves. So the activism is and, and I, I certainly Miguel's work is, is active in every sense. He's a dancer, like he said. But uh, that kind of, I wasn't talking about that kind of work, so I wasn't going to get into that. But but that I mean, the whole communicating with people is a tremendous gift, and being able to photograph them like Miguel does is an even more tremendous gift. I mean, you, it's so many people photograph people without that incredible, intense connection. 
that, that I think that's a part of activism as well. I mean, literally and figuratively. Uh, don't shoot. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, no, let, you know, know, let the conversation go. Yeah. Uh, I, I think that um, <coughs> uh, each time you you have to you, you, you make photography. You choose a point of view in front of the world. So you make a political statement. And even if it's not a, um, with a big brain, it's a political statement. It's a political point of view. Even if you don't think about it in this way, it will happen. And after, you, you, you analyze the, uh, we have to look at the work and its use, which where the work is visible, where we can see it. And that can change during the time. So, it's not, I think we don't have two categories, a militant one and a not militant. We have photography, each of political, political statement and with various life and use. Uh, in French, uh, maybe you translate to it. Okay, donc, uh, par, le commentaire de monsieur, c'était que um, il y a très peu de photographes en fait qui ne se considère pas comme, comme des militants, qu'ils qu assument cette responsabilité. Et la réponse euh, euh, de Lucy, euh, c'était que oui, si on pense à quelqu'un comme Miguel, hein, c'est un militant dans la mesure où euh, il a cet art de, euh, bah, de communiquer avec les gens. Et Raphaël a euh, terminé euh, avec une réflexion euh, sur le point de vue, que chaque photographe en fait, choisit un point de vue qui est une, euh, euh, qui a une valeur politique. Euh, elle refuse en fait euh, cette opposition entre euh, militants, artistes, photographes, euh, oui, et que, euh, voilà. Après, il y avait la question at the same time though if you don't um, if your work is interpreted not the way you intended it this often happens it's uh, it's it's neutralized and so in a, in a funny way you become complicit with the status quo if you don't disagree with those who are misinterpreting your work <laughs> so um, just as soon as it gets tra translated we're going to go ahead and conclude because I think we've run out of time now Lucy, could you please repeat what you said? Thank you. Actually, I'm going to cut things off here because... Uh...